Okay, I believe this is where we had left off with last time, talking about with that of, of the teeth. And one of the things that we would note is the majority of mammals would have molars in common, just the idea of having to uh, grind out their, their food in order to, uh, to increase the opportunity of enzymes to break down their different types of, uh, of food, uh, uh, their, their diet for their food is what I'm trying to say. Okay. So as we move forward, we'll talk about those different types of teeth. Of course, the, the, the front type. And, and the carnivores will have the most diverse. And that meaning uh, incisors for, uh, for biting or for uh, herbivores, then it would be for slicing off their different types of uh, herbivores uh, diets. <clears throat> or vegetation, that's the word I was looking for. There are different types of uh, herbivores and vegetations. And all canines would have these, what we call canines, as, as we would uh, note for, for piercing. And there's uh, uh, one on each side, on the top and bottom, giving a total of four. And premolars uh, is what the author chooses to utilize. I think bicuspids is a better term for that because there's two sharp edges. That would be for uh, shearing and tearing the different types of uh, uh, flesh uh, in, in their diet. And then finally, the molars we had discussed earlier, utilized for, for grinding out the different types of, uh, of food. And having a power, somewhat of a powerful jaw, having one single jawbone is, an, is uh, certainly going to be an advantage to fit all of them uh, teeth into. And here we're talking about this elementary canal all the way from the back of the throat, then in a one-way tube that goes from, uh, again, the pharynx or the back of the throat all the way through the digestive tract. And there's two different types of grazing animals that we would talk about. The, you'd have what we call browsers and, and uh, grazers. And, and what we mean by that is just picture if you were a car, looking at cars or trucks, or if you're uh, maybe at Shields looking at different types of sunglasses or athletic apparel. If a sales associate of some sort comes up and talks to you and says, uh, can, I, can I help you find anything? You say, well, no, I'm just looking, I'm just browsing. That means you may be going from one store, one dealership to the next. You're just looking. You're really not going to be uh, purchasing anything at that time. But the idea is moving from one place to another. Now, again, that would be a browser. A grazer is more so your domesticated cattle, okay? And maybe water buffalo, just the idea of they will stay more so in one spot. Those are your grazers. Your browsers, on the other hand, a good example of that would be uh, perhaps your giraffes, your elephants. Those are animals that are browsers. They don't stay in one spot. So this would obviously uh, make sense for herbivorous diets. These canines would then be, uh, be absent. And what the majority of mammals would have in common is the incisors and the molars. Of course, uh, the, the canines and bicuspids or premolars would be absent for those who uh, feed on, on, on plants. With a lot of the ruminants, there's a, uh, a, sp a specific strain of bacteria that will help produce different types of enzymes to break that cellulose down because it is so difficult for them to do so on their own. So in their gut, okay, as we can see, as the, the food particles travel through the rumen is the, four, the, the first of four parts. Then you have your reticulum which would be your second chamber, 
then I believe it's your O Mason and then your Ava Mason. Those are your, and you will be responsible for knowing those. Rumen Reticulum, O Mason, and Ava Mason. And here again, here we're talking about the bacteria that would break down or aid in breaking down some of them uh, cellulose items. And one way to, to uh, look at this again, the rumen is not only just the first part, but it's going to be the initial digestion. And these food particles may travel in two directions. As uh, for those of you who are familiar with, with cattle, you may see them, uh, what, what appears to be chewing on gum or chewing on, on food long after they've been at the uh, feeding on these animals. Or feeding on these animals, feeding on silage or hay or something to that, or corn, any one of those, okay? And then they regurgitate that, and it looks like they're still chewing long after uh, they've, they've been at, uh, at, at your feeder bunks. Here again is uh, another end of your uh, chambers of, of stomachs. And, okay, carnivorous animals feed mainly on herbivores, okay? Examples, dogs, foxes, weasels, cats, any one of those that would have uh, th those canine teeth. So when we say that digestive tract is not nearly as long, okay, we're talking about the small intestine. It doesn't have to be as long because proteins, as you can see, are so much easier digested. When we, when we would visualize meals are organized, okay, whether that's going on searching for your prey or going out on the hunt, it's continuous like those those uh, browsers that we're talking about your your large herbivores mammals and the most successful of the mammals are those that would feed on both both plants and animals okay omnivores okay pig rats raccoons and most primates and uh, whether you consider humans as primates, uh, us as, as humans, some eat just plants, some eat uh, uh, mainly, uh, but there's going to be a combination where you're going to have both plants and animals that uh, you consume in your diet. We had seen, um, it was called, uh, as sophomores, I believe it was, the success story of the mammals. Foxes are known to do this, though so what it would appear is they would kill more than, than what they would need, but they would stick them away, sometimes chickens or whatever it is that they can uh, gather and then bury them. In, uh, in the in the dirt, of course, in the ground, and maybe in the winter months, come back when food could be scarce. And hibernation is really not that common. Of course, uh, you just associate that with the bears would be your your most common animal that would that would do that. But just another way of coping with uh, getting through the winter. Just the bats that would deal with this, of course. We're talking about using echolocation and sound waves are, are pushed out and it's those sound waves that come back and the bat deciphers them and, uh, and whether an object is above or below them or left and right.
okay? The, the night hunters, okay, diurnals during the day, nocturnal then, as you can see, at night. A gestation period it's uh, what farmers may use to to gauge when they may want to go through uh, having their their pigs or go through their calving seasons Just the only animals that lay eggs, the echidna and the duck and the platypus, those are, of course, monotremes, and I would believe the next would be that of the marsupials, those that are give birth to live young, but they are immature, okay, and develop within the mother's pouch. Finally, into the placentals. Okay, there we go. Then the rest of of the mammals. Just a just a couple species that that lay eggs. And there's a few more, the, known as the marsupials, that uh, give birth to uh, live young. They're immature and then develop in a pouch. And then here we have the rest of of the mammals. Those that give birth because the young develops inside the uterus attached by umbilical cord. And a general rule of thumb, as you can see, the larger the mammal, the longer gestation period. Examples are whales and, and bats. Okay. So that does it for, for this chapter and the, the curriculum. So uh, we'll have uh, some of the papers that are due on Thursday. So you have in-class time to work on these. And we have vocab quiz, the first portion on Wednesday, second portion on Thursday, and that will be it. Juniors will start reviewing beginning next week. Okay, and that is it.